Good evening. I'm Betty Lou McVeigh. Welcome again to Dimension 5. Dimension 5 is produced by WOI-TV with the hope of adding another dimension to the media coverage of the issues and interests of our time. Our program is live, and our subject tonight is World Food and World Hunger. And if you have questions to ask the members of our panel, the numbers to call are 294-7307, and we will accept station-to-station -station collect calls. If you're calling from Des Moines, the number is 244-3738. And now the members of tonight's panel, and we could shoot the whole program if we were to deal with the honors and the accolades and the tributes that are due these gentlemen but we're going to do away with that, are we not? And we will begin with Dr. Louis Thompson. Dr. Thompson is Associate Dean of Agriculture at Iowa State University. <coughs> He's a teacher and an agronomist. Dr. Kenneth Fry is Distinguished Professor of Agriculture at Iowa State University. Lauren Soth is editor of the editorial pages of the Des Moines Register and Tribune, winner of the Pulitzer Prize for Editorial Writing in 1955. Dr. J. Artie Browning is professor of plant pathology, and I will warn everyone ahead of time that you're having a little trouble with your throat tonight, <laughs> so we'll be prepared. Dr. Earl Hetty is C.F. Curtis Distinguished Professor of Agriculture and Professor of Agricultural Economics at Iowa State University. He is executive director of the Center for Agricultural and Economic Development at Iowa State. And we are honored indeed, and it is a privilege to introduce Dr. Norman Borlaug. Dr. Borlaug is recipient of the 1970 Nobel Peace Prize. He is under the direction of the Rockefeller Foundation, director of the wheat program of the International Center for Maize and Wheat Improvement. And he has been brought to the Iowa State University campus by the Botany Club. And we're delighted to have you as a guest, Dr. Borlaug. And I wonder if you're still able to stand and function with the kind of two days you've had. Oh, I think so. Dr. Borlaug spoke to what may be a record-breaking crowd at Stevens Auditorium tonight. And is it true that you came to Ames from Pakistan? Yes, ma'am. I uh, left Pakistan 2 o'clock in the morning on Saturday, their morning, and I arrived in, here in Des Moines on 10 o'clock uh, Saturday night. It's said that the wheat that you've developed has geographical adaptability. It would seem that you too must have. Sometimes, that too. <laughs> sometimes you need it. <laughs> in talking with the m other members of the panel, we decided that it would be interesting to have each of the panel members ask <coughs> Dr. Borlaug some of the questions. You also will be able to ask questions. And so we'll begin with Dr. Thompson. All right. <coughs> Dr. Borlaug, you mentioned uh, tonight that uh, uh, your wheat program has helped uh, Mexico become self-sufficient in wheat production. Uh, there's been some remarkable progress now being made in India that you've talked about. How long will it be before India will be self-sufficient in wheat production? Well, actually, I think uh, they would really be self-sufficient right now if there weren't uh, a situation, if there wasn't a situation where wheat is being substituted in part for rice, which hasn't uh, caught on in the same sort of way. Uh, nevertheless, there's a now a changing situation in rice also, and I think that. Uh, there's a good possibility that in another year, that is not the 71 harvest, but the 72 harvest, they may be self-sufficient in both wheat and rice. Very remarkable. Dr. Fry? Um, <coughs> no, I, we hear so much about the improvement in the productivity, and this, of course, is a very important aspect of agricultural production because you must have the energy there for people. But... Um, what about the improvement in the quality of the uh, products that we're providing for these people, too? Isn't this also an important feature? Uh, most certainly is, especially in uh, those countries and those economies where the people live largely from cereal grains. You see, the diet is automatically uh, balanced pretty much in a country such as the USA, where you're constantly eating a whole variety of animal products, uh, meat of all kinds, and milk and cheese and eggs and uh, together with cereal products and fruit and vegetables. But it just isn't this way in much more than half of the world because they primarily live from cereals. This is their basic diet. And really what's behind this in most cases is the, they have such low purchasing power 
uh, very little income. M many of the people are traditional farmers living outside of the economic currents and, uh, of their own society, and so they live from these cereals, and therefore they're low in protein and poorly balanced uh, protein diets, diets at that. So uh, once we can balance these, <coughs> the next step has to be to improve the quality of this diet by trying to improve the quality of the proteins in cereals and at the same time hopefully trying to make it possible so that they can convert some of this grain to let's say egg production, more milk production, and in the case of some of the land for forage production. This will take a lot longer. And of course we're always faced by this monstrous population growth that stares at you from every angle. Mr. Self? I was reading in the uh, British Journal the other day, Dr. Barlog, and this is a scientist writing. He said with these uh, new uh, standardized varieties of wheat and rice spreading all over South Asia, replacing the uh, old native mixtures <coughs> with uh, uh, the, a plague, uh, a disease might sweep through the area and wipe out, uh, have even worse famines than before. That the, the hazard uh, from disease is greater now that there's so much uniformity in the uh, varieties. Well, uh, Mr. Salt, I, I think I'd have to disagree with this because uh, in the first place, uh, the most of the Varieties that have been grown have been purified types uh, made through reselection, and they really are not mixtures of types. Uh, we had uh, much more of this situation in Mexico, and I began working there 25, 27 years ago. These were real mixtures. But in India and Pakistan, going back to the 30s, uh, when certain of the English scientists, especially the How doctors Howards, uh, and they, in conjunct conjunction with the Indian scientists, made a lot of selections uh, in some of the old types, these mixtures, purified those, and those were the ones that were largely being grown, plus some uh, crosses that had been made back in the 30s uh, that were commercial varieties. And all of these also were susceptible to one or more of the rust uh, diseases when the Mexican wheats were introduced. Nevertheless, you always <coughs> have this problem because uh, a variety uh, defeats its own purpose. Sooner or later, of course, all varieties <coughs> become susceptible to a new race of uh, rust, let's say, or other disease. And the ones that are grown on the largest area become more vulnerable. Uh, now, when we introduce the Mexican varieties, intentionally four different ones of different type of resistance were introduced, but uh, this farmer's pretty shrewd character. Any place in the world, and the little farmer is no different than an Iowa farmer. He might, the, the difference is that the Indian and Pakistani farmers, uh, many of them can't read and write, but that doesn't mean he's ignorant. He can tell in two years' time which one of those varieties will yield 10 or 20 percent more, and he, he's going to put all of his into that. Yeah, but if, if it's, it's uniform wins. all across <coughs> vast areas, one well, right. variety becomes susceptible to a disease, wouldn't it be more disastrous than if you had uh, dozens of local varieties, some more resistant than others? But there are no, none of these that were there are more resistant than I others. See. They were all susceptible. Now let me uh, build the picture uh, a little more broadly. Before the commercial seed lots were moved in, the whole breeding program was changed. We transplanted mm. lock, stock, and barrel out of Mexico. All of our very diverse uh, uh, wheat breeding materials from the uh, completely unselected the whole way near uh, through to uh, where they were essentially fixed varieties. These went by the thousands into India and Pakistan. They were grown by their local scientists, and they picked out the best, reselected in some of them. And I should say from the outset that uh, the breadth of the genetic makeup of this from Mexico is uh, certainly one of the most diverse in the world, if not the most diverse in, in spring wheats. And in Pakistan and India, uh, during the last uh, five years, six years, uh, they have been intercrossing Mexican and Indians, and these are starting to come off the production line at the present time. So uh, I think that even now, in India, there's a great deal of diversification that's already been fed back in. And there, these are the newer ones. Uh, some of the first echelon, following up the original introductions, are 
already occupying several million acres of land, and another year they'll probably be the most predominant types. And now there are many new ones bred in India that are coming online. So you have to keep trying to reshuffle these cards all of the time. Uh, admittedly, whenever you deal with biological phenomena, uh, you're vulnerable to these uh, no matter how much, up to a point, no matter how uh, many precautions you take. Uh, I think the case is right, right here in the Corn Belt this last year in the case of southern leaf blight on, on corn. Uh, you see here, well, had this that happened in Pakistan or India, in either wheat or rice last year, there had been widespread famine. That's there was, there's was no reserve stocks to mount it. Uh, they have, in India, for example, at the present time, they have built up a considerable amount of uh, uh, stored grain, but it certainly wouldn't be adequate to meet this kind of a disaster. And you see, the larger population you have in a country, the more critical this uh, stored reserve becomes, because even in types of in emergencies, could you import the grain? Problem is distribution equally. So with increasing population, you're going to have more of these problems. <coughs> They're all tangled up together, this population and all of the other human needs, food being only one of the many. Dr. It's Hayden. a monster with lots of heads. <coughs> E evidently, at least in wheat, the first stage of green revolution or development has been attained. But a person hears a lot about the second generation problems. Sometimes these are reflected in marketing system. But a person can follow it out to some fairly complex destinations. One of these might be, say, the distribution of these benefits of development. Some people would call this a very explosive part of development and green revolutions that eventually unless everybody benefits that the whole thing might blow up and you've made the investment in development and green revolution. How far would you say the second generation problems have gone in being solved <coughs> and how are they best solved? Well, some of them uh, have been solved up to a point. For example, the first one that uh, reared its ugly head was uh, the one on warehousing. Uh, we could see two years before the first big harvest that uh, there were going to be serious problems, and we told the government to get ready, and they, all of the government planners just laughed at us. They said, well, how many times haven't we had foreign experts tell us this before? That there was a big harvest forthcoming, and nothing ever happened. So they wouldn't believe us until they had it piled all over out under the sky and starting to rain. And then, Mr. Soth, you see, the press really got on them and skinned them. And then they started really building... Uh, warehouses and they caught up with this uh, surprisingly That's one thing well. India does have is a lively free press. That's <laughs> right. And uh, yet, of course, there are many continuing problems. The one that uh, you have mentioned, Dr. Hedy, certainly is uh, one that concerns us all is the distribution of this, uh, these benefits that come from the Green Revolution. Uh, but I, I fail to, uh, or I'm not willing to accept uh, all of the ills that have been pointed at it as something that uh, first of all, are inevitable, and secondly, that uh, uh, necessarily happened because of the Green Revolution itself. I think this situation in East Pakistan right now, where there hasn't been any revolution of any kind except one with guns, uh, illustrates the point. Uh, here's a situation where the agriculture is still stagnant. It looked, it looked up until just a couple of weeks ago that uh, there was hope that in another uh, two years uh, there could be a big breakthrough in rice in East Pakistan. It hadn't happened yet. We were making some progress there on wheat, although wheat is foreign to this environment, except in winter where you can use low-lift pumps to pump the water up out of these inlets, and you can uh, cover three times more land with uh, wheat when the temperatures are low and produce uh, much more food than you can with rice in that particular season of the year. But here's a section of Pakistan, the east wing that's a thousand miles removed from the west wing, and it's the one that exploded first. So uh, I, th I think it's uh, not too easy to analyze all of the, the factors that uh, come to bear on all of these complex problems. And I'm personally convinced that we can never have uh, economic development, social improvement, so long as we have political instability. And this is one of the great tragedies that uh, of the world. And I think with growing populations, uh, not enough jobs to, uh, quite apart from the food problem, uh, not enough jobs to take care of the increase in the labor force, falling behind on that front, falling behind on the educational front, and on the housing and clothing and uh, transport and 
uh, it's pretty grim from many different Unfortunately, angles. Unfortunately, as you make <coughs> progress and you begin to see something better coming, you have a uh, tendency <coughs> to more outbreaks and dissent and revolt. Uh, well, this is always said, but I'm not so sure that this is necessarily true. You see, I'm convinced that probably one of the real stabilizing influences uh, in the Indian election was the Green Revolution and the hope uh, and uh, change in point of view that it brought. I doubt very much that the Congress Party would have survived this election as it did without the Green Revolution. I think here's a case where, where it has brought, temporarily at least, political stability where there was chaos. Not maybe very maybe long you before. should have gone run for prime minister. Well, <laughs> uh, I think Mrs. Gandhi is doing a pretty good job. I got a lot of respect for her as a person as well as as a, a leader of government. And uh, she certainly did very well. The only state in, in the whole nation that she didn't carry with a decisive majority was West Bengal, where, of course, the horrible city of Calcutta is located and one of the worst overpopulated areas in the world is uh, located. Uh, she, she didn't get a decisive majority there. And again, see that population monster keeps staring at you from every angle. So there's no simple answer to all of this very complex problem. But uh, you see, there's some who say that, uh, and good scientists too, that this Green Revolution was all a mistake. We should have let 50 million people die now, soon, rather than 500 million uh, uh, 10 or 20 years from now. Uh, I can't play in this kind of a ball game. I play to win. And uh, those scientists who re write these kind of treaties sitting in air-conditioned offices and philosophizing, I don't have very much respect for them. They post, propose no uh, constructive remedies. All they do is talk in a negative sort of way, and I just can't buy this. That isn't my game, type of uh, football or any other kind of uh, competitive uh, way in life. And I think this holds will to win, uh, which you have to put into a team of scientists that are tackling a food problem or any other problem, as well as into a team of government officials is uh, very decisive in what can be accomplished. Without this, no matter how much brilliance, nothing happens. I remember a comment attributed to you that you can <coughs> plan to talk. You can, they don't, but they, you have to listen to hear them. Yes, they don't shout, them. and you can't hear them over air conditioning in an office. You hear them out in the fields. Well, all too often, people sit in the capital cities of the countries uh, where it's very comfortable and think that they're going to get these plants to talk to them, and it just doesn't happen that way. They talk in a real soft, quiet voice if you're listening close to them. Dr. Borlaug, with the students who come to you for training to be uh, governors of the, of the revolution when they go back to their own countries, do you train them in the fields? They sure do. Now, if there's any that arrive that aren't willing to be there, trained that way, why they soon get an airline ticket right back to where they came from. So we'll get an airline uh, uh, letter there before they arrive, probably. But we've never had to send one back in week yet. Would you, say, would you say the training in the universities in the United States is inadequate in that respect. I think a good many people feel that <coughs> foreign students, particularly from Southeast Asia, when they go back, would like to rep replicate a bit of what they did in the United States. That's right. But you uh, see, is, is there anything that in the training programs that can be done to? Uh, the way we train there, and it's a very different situation than you have here because we aren't equipped to give the, the uh, advanced theoretical training. This isn't our uh, job at the International Institute, but what we do is to get these students and try to make them functional scientists in nine months or a year so that they can do certain kinds of experiments. And they come to us and with all different kinds of backgrounds, some of them with uh, Bachelor of Science degrees or engineer or agronomy degrees, which are as equivalent, and uh, some of them with a Master of Science degree and an occasional one of a postdoctorate. Then we, unfortunately, in some countries where there just are practically no university trained people, have to take people who have probably only briefly been in the universities a year or two. So you've got to do the best you can with uh, what you've got. And we split them into little groups, more or less with the same background, work with them in all of the different disciplines for a few days they're in soil fertility and the agronomic trials and then in 
different aspects of the breeding program, then the plant pathology, uh, and, and entomology, serial chemistry. And Dr. Fry spent uh, uh, about uh, five weeks, I guess, or six weeks, perhaps, with the group uh, two years back. Two years back. I wasn't there. Is it better the for American there. universities to uh, run uh, cooperative uh, programs with the uh, Indian universities, for example, like uh, Ludhiana and and others that uh, our universities cooperate with them? I or is it better to uh, <coughs> concentrate on uh, working on Indian problems here in the U.S.? Well, I think if it were possible, both should be done. You see, uh, uh, there was one point that I didn't quite finish uh, bringing together here. When these young students come to us in Mexico, some of them are brilliant and have come with the good Ph.D. training, whether from European institutions or American, Canadian institutions. And what we try to do is to mix uh, the right proper dose of mud and sweat and frustration right in with the good scientific uh, theoretical training that they've got so they become functional. So they learn something about uh, how to apply this uh, uh, training. You see, most of these boys never came from, or girls, we have a few women scientists with us also, uh, never came from the soil. They were contacted many of them never had any contact with soil. Some of them, if they did, it was very indirect since they were f members of the aristocracy, the land-owning class, but really no field for it. And we try to provide them this. Then there comes a time, you see, when you get a, uh, a real tough core of these people back in their own country. And we had this in West Pakistan a few days ago. I hope it's still there. When the students come back from the U.S. Uh, at the Ph.D. level, if they're hooked onto this team, no problem. They, they fall right in line and they get to the they Can they do it coming straight back from the U.S.? Yes. If, <coughs> they, if this, uh, if this hard core is, uh, is done, there, that's back there functioning. But for example, tip, typically, do they come back that way or do they come back and want to stay in the laboratory? Oh, this depends on the individual, of course. But, uh, uh, but if you've got a winning ball club, a lot of people want to play on that ball club. If you're still losing all the games, nobody wants to be there. They want to be in the laboratory with a white coat on and uh, shutting themselves off from all of these horrible so problems. So you, you mean in the it world. doesn't make any difference what training the student got here? It's the university or institute he goes back to there. It's the sort of program they have organized to bring them in and make them functional. This has to be a, one of the parts of this overall um, way of approaching this. No matter how good the training <coughs> is, unless he can become a part, a functioning part of an organization back there. Uh, if he's alone, almost certainly he will try to do something in his own special discipline. In a few months he'll be frustrated, then he'll go into the laboratory and just as you've said, Dr. Hetty, he'll go back to doing what he did on his doctor's thesis, only in a more elaborate way, closing himself off from all of this horrible problem of human needs on the outside. It's just too big for him to grab a hold of. But if you can g get this team functioning, and no one individual, those ten fingers can't do anything worthwhile. This kind of brain that I carry around, all it can possibly do is to try to get these people functioning and working together. And they've never worked together as a team, whether in athletics or whether in science. It's all the same. And you've got to build this will to win, and you've got to fight at all levels uh, uh, trying to bring this about. And you can't let these young people go up and start fighting with their superiors or they'll have their throat cut and they'll be out of commission and all the training will have been wasted. Some of our own staff's got to do this. Uh, if we get thrown out, why it uh, still hasn't hurt them. Is that the kind of trip you were making to Pakistan to save some of the other team members well, from getting their throat cuts? You have to get tangled <laughs> all up into these things. I've, I've heard you talk more about the social and economic complexities and problems of the development of the Green Revolution and the biological part. If you were starting in again, is that where you would start on I those think problems? Or? Uh, uh, no, I think they have to move together. If your science and technology is right, then the stage is set for manipulation of the economic policy. But you can change the economic policy, and uh, if you don't have some new technology to interject, the impact of that new policy decision will be relatively small. Of course, if you raise the price of grain high enough, by, uh, they'll plant more area, but uh, this won't necessarily increase the yield per, per acre very much. 
uh, which is the, the approach that has to be made. So you've got to get the science and technology, the new methods worked out, and the fertilizer available at the right place and the right time, which is really part of economic planning. Your policy on uh, pricing, so the stimulatory, uh, some credit insofar as is possible, and always the governments are too weak uh, in terms of credits available to do what they should in this. And then too often it's siphoned off for the big farmers rather than for the little ones, and you've got to be battling all along these lines and seeing what you can do, prodding people into uh, worrying about some of the things that you mentioned a minute ago about uh, bigger benefits accruing to the privileged rather than to and many of people are being left in the backwaters and not getting the benefits of this change. Uh, Norm, I think one of the most interesting stories you've been telling us at all turns in, in the contacts we've had with you uh, the last uh, day, day and a half here, I mean, is this interface where you get so many <laughs> disciplines, so many facets which have to work uh, in a coordinate <coughs> in order to produce what is called the Green Revolution. Now here is another interface which has to do with the economics uh, of the whole situation. You uh, have said this uh, fact that you not only have to have a good genotype of a wheat, a good variety in other words, but you've got to have the fertilizer, the fertility, the water, and all the other things to, to go with it. This is uh, something which, of course, uh, I have a feeling as, a, uh, as an agronomist here in Iowa that uh, to the Iowa farmer that this same kind of interaction interface is necessary uh, for profit as well as it is in the areas where you're working. No, I think the principles are the same. I think that the main difference here is you see that through the land-grant colleges and universities, their long-time participation in all of this, uh, this uh, gap has been bridged uh, pretty well both in our research organizations here at Iowa State University and its whole staff in the Extension Service. Uh, it's probably less true now with the very young people coming on to these staffs, but most all of you had some agricultural background as you were growing up. You knew the soil in one way or another. But these, uh, these people uh, mostly haven't had this, and so you've got to try to bridge a lot of these uh, disciplines until they become functional in looking over all of these factors uh, so that they can fit these parts of the package together. Dr. Borlaug, <coughs> uh, in the early 60s, uh, India was producing about 10 million tons of, uh, of wheat, <coughs> and now that's uh, up, uh, above 20. In other words, you've uh, been able to double their production of wheat in just about five or six years. Uh, how was this done so quickly? Uh, we took a shortcut. You see, in Mexico, it took us 12 years to accomplish what we really did in three or four years in Pakistan and, and uh, India. Uh, we <coughs> knew that uh, this was far too long uh, uh, program of uh, development to go about it in the same way as we did in Mexico. So we took these varieties, which had been developed, as uh, someone mentioned here, that they were broadly adapted, they were insensitive to changes in length of day, meaning latitude. You could move them widely. They were insensitive to dates of planting, so long as the temperatures were right and the, and the moisture was there. Does, does that mean the Green Revolution was partly luck? I was no, just it means ask. it was a transplant. <laughs> no, it wasn't luck. Did, were, we you saw this were you surprised that those Mexican wheats no. did as well as they did? Uh, I, had, I had a good feeling that this was going to happen, because the way we used to move them in Mexico, you see, uh, we used to move them from 28 degrees latitude, where we grow them at winter, near the sea level. And then to get an extra generation, we'd take them close to Mexico City or Toluca, which is 18 degrees. That's 10 degrees uh, difference, that's 700 miles. And then we'd lift them up to 8,500 feet in the process. Very different uh, situations. In one case, the days were getting shorter when they were planted, and the other days they were getting longer. Those who didn't fit both situations, we threw them away because we didn't want to... It, it was partly luck for India and Pakistan in the sense that oh, you yes. already had your operation There's going in Mexico. Yes. yes. They yes. really hadn't planned this back at <coughs> the time. No, no. It and so 20 years ago, they would have had to plan it. Right. But we saw this possibility very quickly. And uh, we tested it for two years on farms as well as on experiment stations. We found out that by modifying, modifying the fertilizer practices somewhat to fit the different soil types why everything else was pretty much the same. Didn't you have experience also from testing these wheats in previous years in the 50s in other Latin American oh, yes, countries, yes. even farther south? That's equator. true. And so uh, and, uh, we had intentionally tried to 
up to, so far as possible, build in a broad spectrum of resistance to diseases. So when they were tested, you could see this uh, very beautiful adaptation, so long as they were fertilized right. And of course, the big problem in all of the overpopulated countries where they've been, uh, where agriculture is old and the same land has been cultivated and tired for hundreds of years is a low level of plant nutrients. Now, until you change this with the right kind of fertilizer, why, it doesn't make any difference how good the plant is that you put there, it just won't produce. And so when you change this, automatically you open the door to many other changes. And as soon as we chase checked the, these varieties in India, we, we saw that uh, when they were properly fertilized, uh, planted uh, in the right way, uh, they were surprisingly happy, just like they were back home. And uh, we checked it for two years in many different locations. Then we sent in 300 250 tons of seed to India. And this was 250 tons. Uh, what does this figure out to? Bushels, let's say 8,000, 8, something like that, bushels. And this was checked on hundreds or really thousands of farms with the Extension Service assisting the researchers at that stage. And uh, again, it was very favorable, and they were simple tests of an acre with the new seed and the new technology and the farmer's own seed and his old way of doing it right beside it. And these differences were enormous. And so here you destroyed in one fell swoop the resistance of this farmer to change because the differences in yield were not 10 or 20 percent, which he wouldn't have changed for. He wouldn't take the risk. But frequently they were 100, 200, or even 300 percent. And then if he had the credit, and if the fertilizer was there, he was ready, assuming you'd fix this question of pricing policy and whatnot ahead of time. So the next time when, the, after two years of testing like this, or it's really three years then, with the, including the one with, the, let's say, the 8,000 bushel, the government of India imported 18,000 tons in 1967. Now, this is a whole freighter shipload full of uh, seed. Up to that time, it was the largest uh, probably international transaction in seed that had ever been handled in the world. Uh, by doing this, rather than increasing those small samples that we had first sent there, you saved five to seven years' time. And so this is why it burst in suddenness on as far as most of the world was concerned. Yes. It looked like we were taking a big gamble, but we had checked actually these things uh, uh, in uh, two or three years' time very widely. And right. it wasn't such a calculated risk. It was calculated. The whole life process is a calculated risk. When you get up in the morning, <coughs> you never know whether you're going to survive the day or not. You might get run over by a car, but uh, it, it was uh, pretty well thought out and measured as to what the probabilities were that it would succeed. <coughs> Gentlemen, we will continue our discussion. We will remind our viewers that if you have questions for the panel, the numbers to call are 2947307. Unless you're calling from Des Moines, then it's 2443738. And I haven't forgotten Dr. Brown again. He will have the first question on the next part of our discussion. We'll be back after this message. And we continue our discussion of world food and world hunger. And Dr. Browning, you have a question coming. Betty Lou, I want to, as a plant pathologist, go back to the question that uh, Mr. Soth asked. But to do so, I need to give just a little more background on Dr. Borlaug. Some of our viewers will know that Dr. Fry and I developed and released multiline varieties of oats to uh, control crown rust in Iowa. And what they don't know was that well before we started working on this, Dr. Borlaug was extolling the virtues of heterogeneity in controlling disease in small grains, and in fact has given far more publicity to this as a means of disease control than has, I suppose, all the other scientists in the world. And so as a very concerned plant pathologist in this area, it gives me some pause to realize that there is a man concerned about this uh, behind the Green Revolution. I, I say this to point out that he would be very cognizant of the dangers involved. And um, the danger involved was emphasized for us very well last year in the seriousness of the <coughs> southern corn leaf blight because of the Texas male sterile that I'm told permeated something like 95 percent of all the corn of the United States. 
and in visiting today, I'm satisfied that uh, they're doing everything they can to get heterogeneity into the Mexican, uh, Indian, and Pakistani wheats. But there is, I, I see here, and this is a, I'm coming down to my question, I see here, though, another way that this could be creeping in. Just like uh, disease susceptibility crept in with the Texas male sterile in corn, and in probably, I would guess, 75, 95 percent of the wheats today, or at least those of tomorrow, will have the dwarfness genes from the Norin wheats from Japan. And I wonder, Dr. Borlaug, is there a chance that this might be repeated, that there might be something being associated with these dwarf genes that uh, could be deleterious when planted over such an extensive acreage? Well, there's always this possibility, I suppose, but uh, nevertheless, uh, <coughs> Uh, <coughs> we've tried to incorporate and still maintain, and, and I should point out that there are several different other sources of dwarfing, none of them as effective as the norine dwarf genes that we're using. Uh, I hope we don't have such linkages, but uh, this could happen. How much? We have, uh, for example, also I might point out that we're now in the process of trying to uh, build a multi-line variety uh, such as uh, you and Ken are working on and oats or that you've released in this one most widely grown variety because the farmers just won't quit growing this mm -hmm. thing uh, completely because it's been highly successful uh, even though many farmers are converting over to newer varieties uh, with entirely different types of backgrounds we still uh, want to use this one so as soon as we can diversify the resistance that's within it, because it has uh, unusual yield ability. So we work at it from... I was, I was just going to ask, in terms of probabilities, how big a buffer stock or carryover <coughs> of cereals should India have with the chance that a d disease might come along and wipe it all out in one year? Well, they're trying to carry 7 million metric tons in warehouses uh, at the present time. The proportions of wheat to rice uh, isn't very clearly defined. It's uh, because they're still importing grain, uh, most of which is. Uh, but that's uh, that's to meet weather. To meet to meet this kind of unknown possibility here. I don't think that they can. Uh, I don't think that they have the wherewithal, not only the physical facilities, but the capital that they can tie up in this sort of thing. They'll I have think to rely on uh, the United States <coughs> to carry a, a reserve for them to some extent. Well, this, you know, is one of my pet gripes in the world. I think the United States gets stuck with too many of these responsibilities all alone. You know, way back in the time of the Old Testament, when Joseph uh, was interpreting the Pharaoh's dreams, why they conceived and actually carried out the, the whole idea of uh, warehousing for the lean years and made it function, apparently. That's the what years the Bible says, anyway. All right. Uh, uh, now, as far as our own internal needs under... Uh, our own storage of uh, CC commodity uh, credit corporation stocks. Uh, I think that we did carry uh, adequate stocks, maybe sometimes too many stocks, but uh, nevertheless, this uh, this served a useful need, as we have found out now this past summer. If, if we should have uh, another southern corn blight thing, well, we don't have that kind of reserve now. Maybe the ice was a lot thinner than most of us realized, and we're skating around pretty happily. So, uh, what I've said many times is the uh, Food and Agriculture Organization, the United Nations, uh, this should be a responsibility where everybody puts some money into this, where there are stocks, storage all around the world, and the United <coughs> States shouldn't be the only one that's uh, paying for this. Okay, all of the nations that... that big the, this uh, grains agreement at the time of the Kennedy round is a partial step in that direction. But it hasn't been implemented no. into an effective program, and I think this is one thing that we'll have to have as we get more people around the world if we're going to stave off these kinds of disasters. And they'll have to be dispersed, and all of the developed countries should participate, as well as, the, as possible the underdeveloped countries themselves. I don't think there's any sound way to stave off disaster of this type except diversity. No, There's a, an article in, I believe, The Last Science by a well-known scientist uh, relative to southern corn leaf blight, and he concludes that there should be uh, wide research programs in which we can study all the possible diseases 
and learn control method, methods before they get here. Well, I'm, I'm not against this type of research whatsoever, but I would submit that the only protection whatsoever against the unknown is diversity. That's right, because you can't even test for it until you've got to know what's coming from the test prepare. button. <coughs> Let's go back to this uh, food reserve uh, business because uh, uh, any time that we start <coughs> to build up stocks, uh, Laura and my the prices begin to fall, as we're seeing now in the case of corn. Uh, <coughs> how, how much reserve should a country carry in terms of, say, percentage <coughs> of its uh, annual consumption? I don't think that I'm qualified to answer this. I think you, Dr. Hetty, should uh, well, I, uh, I give think your idea on this. I think in India they have some rules of thumb drawn out of the air. If I remember right, 12 million tons or 20 million tons. But Louis is kind of the statistician of the group. <coughs> it could be tackled actuarially. And some good simulation models of weather could be built up, drawing on samples, so there doesn't have to be as much of a guess as we're guessing right at the present time. I think their quantities right now are pure guesses out of the air. Now, let's see, India pr uh, produces uh, something under 100 million tons of grains. It's about 100 million at the so present time. So <coughs> if you're talking about 12 million, you're talking about really uh, about a month and a half supply, aren't you, uh, in reserve? And here in this country, uh, what would you say, Lauren, that we ought to have? Well, uh, the figures that, uh, as far as I know, are still uh, generally used, Errol, are uh, about a billion bushels of corn <coughs> at October 1, carryover of, of old corn on as the new crop starts to come in, and about, um, uh, what was it, uh, 600 million bushels of wheat, I think, is what uh, people have, have generally used as a as a safe reserve, not just for this country, but including some reserve for uh, food for peace and that sort of thing. Of course, there's, uh, I think, one difference here also is the way the uh, government of India uh, estimates its needs and also not only estimates it, but states uh, what it has stored. These are government stocks. And you see the, the small farmer, which represents in many cases 70 to 80 percent of the people, well, say 75 percent in India. They're constantly uh, storing grain uh, to for their own needs. So it's hard to uh, tie this all together into a sensible uh, uh, plan. But this you're uh, right, this stock ought to be an be international huh? cooperative arrangement. I agree with that. You know, uh, it looks like now that uh, in 1970, the only grain that we produced more of than we produced the previous year was rice. We produce less corn, wheat, rye, barley, and oats in 1970 than <coughs> in 1969 in the world. So we'll see a, a rapid drop in stocks uh, uh, when they're reported that this next July. So w we may hear a lot more about the world food problem a year from now than we've heard in the past five years. Uh, it, it appears to me that there may be one other uh, feature here, too, if I read the uh stories uh, correctly on this. Uh, you're talking here about a wheat reserve, as I understand it, in oh, India. Oh, this would be mainly wheat and rice, yeah. some maize also. But uh, here, I think one of the features that we've seen of the uh, <coughs> decrease in production from the southern corn uh, leaf blight this last year is that we're not only using uh, corn out of reserve for this, but this is shifting over as the price changes with other grains so that you remove all grains, in a mm -hmm. sense, from reserve. They're and we have this multiple source, you see. We're not only storing corn or we're not only storing wheat. We're storing a whole series of grains, any one of which, uh, to a certain extent, in livestock feeding at least, can substitute for another one when the price differential becomes correct. Well, you know, I would expect that right now, under the present situation, there's more wheat being fed as a grain than probably ever before in the history of the U.S., isn't that right? Mm -hmm. I don't know. More than any year since 1943. Since 43. This country fed about 500 million bushels of wheat in 43 because of a shortage of feed grains. But, uh, and then we had a big reserve at that time, too. But uh, this year it's going to be something over 200 million bushels of uh, wheat will be fed in this country as a feed grain. With your contribution success on the biological aspect of increased production so on, you are more concerned now with the population and population control than the ability to produce. Right. If we could just stabilize this thing. But this <laughs> monster is the other side of that coin. Do you, do you think there's a chance that we could? 
have we invested relatively enough? <coughs> Say we haven't invested proportionately in <coughs> reproduction and so forth when it comes to education and communication. We probably haven't invested relatively the same. If we made the same kind of input, would we be successful or what kind of a time lag would I be involved? I think that uh, if uh, we're going to come to grips with this problem, I think that uh, with the point you, Dr. Hedy, have just uh, you have raised about uh, basic studies on human or the biology of uh, uh, reproduction, the human species, is one that uh, we've done something on uh, with the estrogens and the pill, if you want to call it that, uh, these sorts of things and also mechanical devices. But for people, illiterate peoples, uneducated peoples, these are uh, still a long way from being foolproof, a uh, long way from uh, b uh, being easily to handle. And I have the feeling, uh, which I assume you have also from what you've just implied, that if you could find some sort of thing that you could, uh, that would take care of this situation for a whole year, uh, might be a big step forward and maybe begin to make progress. Whether this is uh, biologically, uh, medically possible, without Didn't all you sorts of. Did you develop a wheat uh, that really uh, <coughs> had uh, sterilizing effect the way the Indian people <laughs> thought it would? You know, this is be one of the things that I think we ought to strive for. And you know, such things actually happened in Australia, not in the cereal grains, unfortunately, but in the subterranean clovers. After World War II, you see uh, the. Australian farmer and rancher uh, completely revolutionized uh, forage production and in the process consequently uh, of mutton production, wool production, by having vastly improved pastures. And these were based for the most part on mixtures of subterranean clovers uh, and grasses. And it became evident after a certain number of years that uh, when the ewes uh, were placed out on these winter pastures where most all of it was subterranean clovers, why all at once the, uh, there was a lot of abortion in the, in the uh, a very low <coughs> uh, rate of uh, birth. Pregnancy was all right, but nothing happened after that. And the guys were going broke. <laughs> and they, of course, it became uh, evident that something was uh, upsetting the whole uh, hormone system because the withers, the castrated males, of course, started growing mammary glands. Mm -hmm. well, this gave it away, and when you start <coughs> analyzing the seeds and the burrs of these subterranean clovers, some of them were very high in estrogens. This was uh, the pill that was bred right into them, or that was you, there. Do, do you think a scientist could get away with starting out to do that? Well, I'd <laughs> like to give it a try. If I could just get that <laughs> thing crossed over into wheat, I wouldn't say anything, and then uh, Maybe if we got this going, and wheat, and corn, and barley, and all the rest of them, and rice, maybe we'd have something going. You see, uh, these compounds, uh, at least in the case of the legumes, they exist. Well, you can <coughs> select against them. In Australia, two, two devices or two approaches uh, corrected this problem as far as sheep production is concerned. One, simply keep the, the uh, ewes off the pasture for a few weeks until the embryo was well implanted. Uh, secondly, uh, select out strains that were low in estrogen and there was no problem. The problem doesn't exist anymore, but here you see these things are around in nature. Unfortunately, no one's ever seen them in a cereal grain. That's where we need them. Uh, one of the uh, more, um, oh, one of the things that scares you even more, though, uh, it, when you look at this population, you <coughs> talked uh, tonight about buying 20 to 30 years, perhaps, in which to bring population uh, under control, or s uh, maybe that's not exactly the way you said it, but uh, it gives that idea. But you see, um, if you start with, um, unless you start and say, no more reproduction, the problem is that the reproducing group of people continues to increase at a much faster pace than the others do because now we're, we have so many youngsters, in other words. Yeah. Such a large are. percentage of your population <coughs> today are under 15, those who come into the reproductive stages within the next decade. Well, just even if you were to cut back on the number of children per family, 
you still have a built-in growth factor sure. here that will continue for some long period of time beyond the 20 to 30 years I think that you have sure probably well, that's 40 or 45 in the poor countries yes probably 40 or 45 yeah. Right. Uh, I'm a, I mean, right. under our uh, under our standard of uh, living, yes. it's probably got a built-in thrust that'll carry you forward uh, uh, now. Mm -hmm. A country same. such as Mexico, you see, has uh, the recent census first uh, estimates of census figures just came out about a month ago, and I was horrified to see that 50% uh, of the population is less than 20 years 20 years or younger. And you, so you see, you've got a tremendous built-in reproduction potential right there. Tying this in some with uh, nutrition, I was visiting recently with um, a professor on another campus who is very concerned with protein and protein supplement in uh, developing countries, who was actually advocating that in the event such a thing were available and financially feasible, that it be withheld <coughs> until after population is brought under control for the simple reason that it will bring uh, youngsters into a reproductive biological reproductive uh, stage that much sooner, give them a longer period in which to reproduce. Well, even if we were to have zero population growth, say gradually achieved by the year 2000, we'll still have better than four and a half million people. Sure. So <coughs> the uh, question that I uh, keep raising myself uh, when I see uh, trends in production of grain per acre around the world and, and the uh, limitations <coughs> we have on arable land is the uh, Really, what, what, uh, how many people will our agriculture support? Uh, would you want to make any guess as to what you think would be the, uh, uh, with the kind of technology that we know today? Uh, worldwide? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, this, of course, is just a wild guess, but because I don't think you, uh, the information is available to make an educated guess on this. Uh, Certainly, if, uh, if the, all the information we have available now could be applied, why, I think you could sustain. That doesn't mean give a decent standard of living mm -hmm. uh, to twice the number of people that are present in the world right now. Is that but you see, this is a sad situation the way it is now. More than half the people are hungry <coughs> at least uh, several days of the week. And I don't think we should uh, set this as our model. This is a pretty sad situation. Uh, we've got to correct this Does horrible situation first and try to uh, go on from there. Do those estimates include food from the sea and also simulated <coughs> meat, for example? I suppose that if Americans, Western Europeans, grew to like simulated meats as well as the real thing, that it would somewhere triple or quadruple amount of cereals. Uh, you mean if, uh, if synthetics, uh, mm -hmm. synthetic foods were used? Oh, I'm Just from sure agriculture materials. I'm sure that this uh, sort of thing could happen. And uh, of course, it's my fundamental belief that uh, uh, I would certainly see, hate to see the standard of living of the U.S. Uh, step way down to take care of other parts of the world that have got this urgent problem for the moment. That doesn't mean we shouldn't be careful uh, as a nation that we don't end up in this same uh, horrible situation all too soon. But the es estimate but would make some difference if the one estimate were double, <coughs> assuming this present pattern of diet in the rest of the world, that would still give us a margin of safety. We could go further if we had to. Yeah. Well, I was just going to say that I, I don't think it's very useful to uh, try to look at this in a global way. Uh, how many people we're going to have on the, on the earth right. and uh, how much we can produce because uh, the movement of people is very limited. Uh, there are not very many people going to come here uh, <coughs> to this country from Asia. But you have trade. And you have trade, but that's limited. Uh, uh, basically, you're dealing with a problem that's in India uh, by itself. We can help a lot and should and do, but uh, uh, the fact that we could double our output in this country very easily. <coughs> no problem there. That, that would be very easy, <coughs> but that doesn't really help India. Right. You could do this. You see, you could solve this uh, total uh, food need right now by just turning loose the American sure. farmer, the Canadians, the, sure. the uh, if you could solve Australian, all the other and, the, uh, and the Argentinians, and if you could Why convince not? the Russians to get to work and put some fertilizer on their land uh, to not? do this. <coughs> but how would you distribute it? 
why not <coughs> rent those 60 million acres we aren't producing anything on to Indians and have them come and farm it and take it home? I think they might stay. <laughs> uh, Earl, we're going to have uh, half out of the 60 back in production this next summer. 25. 25. Yeah, that much. So you see, uh, uh, the, the problem would still be, how do you distribute this? It's the same old problem we've been knocking our heads against the wall on all the time. The countries are too poor to pay us <coughs> well, uh, some in the currencies that we want to accept. And even if the countries could, their people are too poor so that they couldn't uh, buy it from their government and you'd just get all stuck up in this and uh, this is where it all ends up. Are, are people too optimistic on the Green Revolution? In India they're projecting very soon, year after next, or s certainly by 1775, they can meet all their cereal needs. And every other country is going to produce cereals and export it to the rest of the world. There maybe isn't <coughs> enough market to take care of all the cereals that everybody's planning to produce to export. But is that, is this an over-optimistic view, just as the population <coughs> scare of five years ago was an overly pessimistic view? Is each one of them swung a little too far? Well, I, I would imagine so, and I think that, you see, <coughs> even if they become self-sufficient in, uh, let's say, wheat and rice in India, uh, they've got to, at the same time, uh, get something happen, make something happen on sorghum produce, uh, production. This is one of the very extensive <coughs> sorghum crops. The yields are very low, the millets. But what's even more important, you see, is that because there has been no research done or inadequate research in the whole breeding and in the cultural practices of, let's say, chickpea or gram, the lentils, which are their main, and some of the beans, their main <coughs> source of protein to supplement the diets of the cereals, these things are getting pushed out. And the first thing that you've got to try to do is to convert part of the land no longer needed for cereals to a production of expanded production of these crops. But that's easier said than done. Now, you can manipulate economic policy, pricing, but it's a poor substitute for increasing efficiency because the yields will still, still be so low that uh, it's just a bad investment for the approach it from this standpoint uh, as far as the government is concerned. And yet, uh, it's pathetic, the small amount of research that has been done up to now, and you're <coughs> going to build a very dynamic program in less than 10 years to get a payoff of maybe 15 years. How about soybeans in India? Well, the uh, University of Illinois has been uh, working and uh, finally has got uh, some of these things started going pretty good in one area, especially in Uttar Pradesh. Uh, I think they've made a lot of progress in the last two years. Now suddenly they come up with some real bad virus diseases that uh, looks like uh, <coughs> there's going to be a lot of scrambling before they get this undone. Hmm. So uh, They've also run into some of these sort of second generation problems. I remember right in some district, one producer was producing more soybeans than he could find a total market for. It's not that the market couldn't be developed, but it hasn't been developed at the present time, too. This is true. All of these things. You know, I'd, I would like to come back to statements made while I go about uh, uh, our being able to double our production in this country. Um, what would it take, though, to double it? Because, you see, uh, a lot of our top farmers uh, are raising questions now. Why can't they get off the yield plateau in corn? 